everyone, um, and welcome to our event with Amanda Ripley for her new book, High Conflict, Why We Get Trapped and How We Get Out. She's in conversation tonight with Jason Marsh. My name is uh, Evan Karp. I'm the events manager for Booksmith. We're an independent bookstore and mainstay of San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district since 1976. Uh, this event is part of our Berkeley Arts and Letters series, which since 2009 has been featuring exceptional authors with new books. Uh, we've hosted everyone from Patti Smith to Masha Gessen and Michael Eric Dyson. Um, tonight's event is a, a collaboration and co is co-presented by the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley. Always happy to, uh, to work with uh, the Greater Good Science Center and um, I hope that you've joined us for some of our previous events, which have, have all been truly excellent. Um, so uh, without further ado, tonight's stars. Jason Marsh is the executive director of UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center and the founding editor in chief of the center's award-winning online magazine, Greater Good. Amanda Ripley is the New York Times bestselling author of The Smartest Kids in the World and The Unthinkable. She writes for The Atlantic, Politico, The Washington Post, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal, among other publications. Amanda, um, congratulations on the book. We're very happy to have you here with us tonight. And um, Jason, thank you for being here to lead the conversation. I'm excited to stop talking and to turn it over to you too. Um, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Evan, really appreciate it. Um, it is always really uh, fun and a privilege for us to co-host events with Booksmith and Berkeley Arts and Letters. So thanks for being such great partners. Um, thanks to our team as well at the Greater Good Science Center, especially Katie Mazzari for all the work behind the scenes to organize events like this. Um, and especially thank you uh, to all of you. I know we've had um, a good size uh, turnout, I think around 1200 or so folks who are planning to join us this evening, which we're really excited about and hope you're all uh, healthy and well wherever you are uh, around the country and really pleased and grateful that you could join us this evening. Um, and a uh, huge thanks to Amanda Ripley for joining us as well. We've been big fans of Amanda's work for a while. I've been really eagerly anticipating the release of High Conflict, really excited uh, about the book. Um, and it really resonates with a lot of our work at the Greater Good Science Center. We have a, an initiative we've been running for a couple of years on bridging differences, exploring how to foster constructive dialogue and understanding. Uh, drawing on best practices from science and from programs to really foster uh, more constructive engagement across lines of difference between groups. Um, and I think moving forward, as we explain that initiative to people and try to help them understand what it's all about, um, my job got a lot easier because I can essentially now just tell them to read High Conflict. Um, it really captures so much of, I think, what we're uh, trying to do through that initiative, through our work at the center in general, uh, it really speaks to the intense social and political polarization um, that are really gripping our country, but it also, I think, offers these really wise and timeless lessons for navigating conflict that are helpful at any time, you know, across human history, really. Um, many of us in our lives have faced, you know, kinds of, of deep interpersonal challenges um, that are really hard to get out of. And I think uh, Amanda's book does an amazing job of shedding light on why we get into those conflicts and, and also how to navigate them more constructively. So thank you, Amanda, for, for writing it and for joining us. Thank you so much, Jason. It's great to be here with all of you. Uh, so I wonder first, just the, the distinction, if you could make between what you mean by high conflict and good conflict in the book, what's high conflict? Yeah, well, I started out just on this quest to find, you know, examples of people who had been stuck in really ugly conflict and gotten out just, you know, to find some hope. What were the patterns? Like literally step by step, not a fantasy, but real people. And I realized pretty quickly that I was asking the wrong question because it's, it's really not about getting out of conflict because conflict can be really good and healthy. It's, it's getting out of high conflict, right? So uh, high conflict can start small, but it becomes an us versus them kind of feud. Our brain behaves differently. Um, it becomes sort of all consuming and high conflict takes on kind of a life of its own. Like it starts to operate on autopilot and everything you do to get out of high conflict often makes it worse. So that's a sure sign of, of high conflict um, is, is that it just, it doesn't, operate according to the normal rules of engagement. 
And it sort of doesn't go anywhere. It's, it, there is a feeling of being stuck in high conflict, being frozen, and you just have the same fights over and over and over. Um, so high conflict is the destination. Whereas with good conflict, you can still get really angry and frustrated. It, it can be intense and heated, but there's a feeling that it's going somewhere. You know what I mean? And I know this sounds a little squishy, but I actually think I, I have no trouble telling the difference now. <laughs> Like it's, it's a bright line. Uh, so, so in fact, like good conflict, there are flashes of curiosity, more questions get asked in the research. This is pretty clear. Um, and people tend to leave the conflict more satisfied, even if they don't agree. Right. So that's not actually the only goal of conflict. Right. So uh, good conflict, I think we need much more of in the United States and around the world. High conflict, we need much less of. Yeah, and you explained there are actually some uh, helpful questions that you offer in the book to ask yourself to help understand whether you are actually trapped in high conflict versus good conflict. I wonder if you could share some of those just to kind of tease out what are those telltale signs of high conflict so we know it when we're in it. Yeah, no, there are some questions you can ask yourself, um, <laughs> which, uh, you know, I, and I say this including myself, I've definitely been there. And I think we've all either experienced high conflict or certainly witnessed it in the last few years, politically, um, if not personally. So it can, be, it can be everything. It can be an interpersonal conflict. It can be a political conflict. It can be a professional conflict. It can be with someone you've never met, which is wild, right? But one of the questions to ask yourself is, uh, am I losing sleep over this conflict? Do I feel happy when the other person or other side suffers in some way, even if it doesn't benefit me? Um, do I find that when I discuss this conflict with people who agree with me, I leave that conversation sort of more frustrated? Like it doesn't, there's no, nobody's illuminating or enlightening each other at this point. So those are some of the questions that I think can help figure out if, if, you're, if you might be in high conflict. Um, yeah, and I think those are uh, as you're saying them, I'm like checking off a lot of the <laughs> reactions yeah. I've had, especially I think for a lot of us, you know, just uh, reading the news and engaging in any kind of, uh, you know, quasi political dialogue uh, over the last few years. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, thinking about how we consume conflict and um, your role as a journalist, I mean, journalists are supposed to thrive on conflict, right? You, you quote an editor in the book, uh, said something like, you know, all great stories involve conflict. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a bit about what led you to write a book that's actually a warning about certain kinds of conflict. Right, so about four years ago, I just felt like I had to do something differently as a journalist because I was just gonna make the conflict worse. You know, when I wrote about politics or other conflicts, it just felt like even if I, even if I weren't intending to, right? Some people are intending to, for sure. Uh, but even if you're not intending to in high conflict as a journalist, it's really easy to just make things worse or certainly not be helpful, right? Um, you end up amplifying instead of illuminating really easily. So I knew I wanted to do something different, but I actually didn't know what. <laughs> I felt like there was a lot I just wasn't understanding about this conflict, even though, as you say, I felt like I'd spent 20 years writing about conflict. You know, I didn't think I was afraid of conflict. I didn't think I was um, unfamiliar with it. And I remember distinctly interviewing a woman who was a conflict mediator and used to be a journalist on Capitol Hill covering politics. And she said that if she knew what she, if she as when, went back in time and <laughs> could do it differently, she would go deeper into the conflict as a journalist and, 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 and really ask much harder questions. And I thought, wow, that's surprising because people are always criticizing journalists for being too focused on the conflict. But what we often do is sort of throw jet fuel on the conflict rather than investigating it and helping people understand what's really going on. So, you know, I started hanging out with a lot of people who study conflict intimately, who do experiments on conflict and who uh, have worked all over the world on conflict and realize that there, there is a system, like it is an, a system of interlocking weather patterns, conflict, especially high conflict. And you really have to think of it that way. And, and once I, I understood that, other things made sense to me. Like I was no longer baffled and mystified by headlines, right? Mm -hmm. uh, everything kind of made sense. And then it was about, okay, well, how do I, how can I be useful given that? So that's when I started looking for people who had 
been in high conflict and shifted to good conflict from a politician in California to a former gang leader in Chicago to an environmental activist in England to regular voters in uh, rural Michigan and in New York City who saw the world very differently. So trying to find those real people and communities who had made that shift and figure out, you know, what did they have in common? Right. Yeah. And you, I mean, you, you report on some amazing stories and some really intense and violent conflicts. Um, I mean, you're, you're reporting on the Colombian Civil War and gang violence in Chicago, uh, debates in the New York Jewish community over the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, which are always really intense. Um, but for me, really surprisingly, some of the most jaw-dropping moments in the whole book came from the story of Gary Friedman, um, who just ran for local office in his you know, little town of Muir Beach, which is 250 people, like a totally idyllic, beautiful spot just up the coast uh, from me here. It's one of my favorite spots uh, in the world. Um, but tell me, you know, with all the huge conflicts that are consuming our country and, you know, big stories of, of national polarization and partisanship really dominating the headlines, why were you drawn to Gary's story? You know, the funny thing is I got mediation training from Gary when I started working on this book and he's a gifted trainer. He's like one of the country's leading experts in conflict. He helped invent conflict mediation, really thoughtful guy. And somewhere along the way in this training, he said that he had run for local office and it hadn't gone the way he'd expected. So I thought, huh, that's worth checking in on. <laughs> and so we stayed in touch and I ended up spending a lot of time with Gary because even though it's like a shoebox diorama, it's like a teeny tiny, yeah. very low stakes example of political polarization. Sometimes it's easier to see what's happening with something that isn't right at the center of our conflict. That's a little one off or an extreme outlier. Like those kinds of things, I think from a storytelling point of view, make things clearer in a way. So the fact that Gary Friedman was drawn into high conflict in his little town, despite everything he knew, was really interesting to me. And, and he was so thoughtful and humble and open about how that happened and what he had to do to get himself back into good conflict, that it seemed like a really, like a gem of a story, a, a cautionary tale on the one hand, because clearly if someone like that can get drawn into high conflict, then you know I can too. So it is a story partly about how magnetic high conflict is, how hard it is to resist and why that is some of the forces that make it May, you know, sort of pull you in. And then also a story of what Gary did to get himself out of that right. situation, um, which, is, which is hopeful. Yeah, yeah, we'll say a little bit more. I mean, I think with Gary, what was telling was, you know, it wasn't just that he got drawn into the conflict and became a player. He became arguably in this whole story, it seems like from this distance, just the worst perpetrator as well, right? It wasn't just that um, he wasn't able to deploy his, his skills as a mediator, he actually, um, does things that when you first meet him seem uh, unthinkable, really, that, you know, it's so, so out of character. So I wonder if you could share a little bit about, um, a little bit more on his story and, and some of what he did, and also what you feel like that says about the nature of high conflict, the way that it can actually influence our behavior and our judgment. Well, there were a couple things that happened that are very common to other high conflicts. Um, but you hit on something really important and maybe the most chilling pattern I've seen in every high conflict, including Gary's, which is eventually everybody involved starts to mimic the behavior of their enemies. Like they start doing the thing that they got into the fight to stop mm -hmm. on some level, right? Yeah. Almost always without realizing it at first. So there's something really diabolical about that paradox, that irony. In, in Gary's case, he did go into politics to make it less toxic and more inclusive beyond a doubt. And he ended up making it temporarily more toxic and less inclusive, right? So how did that happen? So there are a few conditions that seem to reliably create high conflict. Uh, one of them is the presence of what I call conflict entrepreneurs. So uh, anyone can act like a conflict entrepreneur. I'm sure I have as a journalist. And it's basically someone, a person or a company that exploits conflict for their own ends. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's more personal. It's someone who just delights in every twist and turn of the conflict, who finds meaning and camaraderie and connection in conflict, right? And sort of being aware of that is super helpful <laughs> and has yeah. been to me. But anyway, 
in Gary's case, you know, he ended up relying on a seasoned political organizer who happened to live in the neighborhood and uh, was, you know, volunteered to help him. So that immediately kind of put the campaign into the adversarial us versus them uh, framework of national politics and of union politics and other things that are already deeply steeped in high conflict in lots of ways. So he started referring to himself and his allies as the new guard, like they were the upstarts, the change agents, right? Um, you know, never mind that Gary was in his 70s and significantly older than, than some of the other people running, but in his mind, he was really, you know, a revolutionary. And then he started referring to the other people, the incumbents, as the old guard, right? And this was, this was not, the old guard didn't know they were the old guard, right? <laughs> but anytime you divide humans into two oppositional camps. And you know this from your research at the yeah. Greater Good Science yeah. Center. It's, yeah. It just really brings out our worst conflict instincts. Um, so he, he did that. Politics does that quite often, the competitive nature of it. Um, and then he also, he had a lot at stake beyond what he said he was doing. And, and it was important for him to eventually realize that. But um, another common thing that leads to high conflict is humiliation, right? So when, when he felt like he'd gone in as a savior to help this little town and it wasn't working, he was getting made fun of by some people, like his tools and his lifelong mediation model didn't seem to be working, that felt you know, humiliating. And that is also something that can easily lead to high conflict. Yeah, well, I'd love for you to say actually a little bit more about that because reading a book about high conflict, I think you'd expect to read about emotions like anger or contempt or envy but you really zero in on humiliation consistently as a key driver of high conflict. Talk a little bit about the relationship between how humiliation actually then tends to lead to or perpetuate high conflict. Yeah, I have a whole new found respect and fascination with humiliation and how volatile it can be. Anger's good. Anger's all good. Like that is, can be very uh, initiatory and constructive, right? Um, contempt is a different thing, much more dangerous, but Humiliation, there's a um, psychologist and physician who studies conflict and war named Evelyn Lindner, and she calls humiliation the nuclear bomb of the emotions. And I think that's about right. Um, it's probably the most underappreciated explanation for what happens you know, politically, internationally, in war, in gang violence, in prison violence. I mean, you name it, in domestic violence, it is this, this force that can really turn into a poison. And what's one of the things that's so interesting about humiliation is that like other emotions, right? It's informed partly by our society, by our norms, by the people around us, right? It, it's not really fully objective. What's humiliating, what's not. You know, I follow a, a former gang leader named Curtis Toller who experienced a really awful loss as a kid and he saw it as humiliating. Mm -hmm. But he could imagine a world in which he didn't see it that way and how differently his life might have been. Just as a quick example, during World War II, uh, guards in concentration camps would order uh, prisoners to make and remake their beds until they were perfect, like a kind of harassment. And uh, Holocaust survivors told the psychologist Nico Frieda about this. And he noticed something interesting, which is that male Holocaust survivors said they felt humiliated by that experience. But female survivors did not feel humiliated. You know, they, they felt other things, right? They, they, it was one indignity among many. It was frustrating. It was annoying. Um, definitely it was not right, you know, but whether it felt humiliating depended on the person's identity and their concept of the world, what it meant to matter and not matter. So gender was in there for sure. But um, this is the reason I dwell on that is because this is where conflict entrepreneurs are also really important and group leaders is because they frame things as humiliating, right? right? We saw this with President Trump. He would often frame things as humiliating, as a grievance, as a personal attack. And that's one way to incite high conflict. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I can't help but think that it's also cultural to a certain extent in that, you know, there is obviously a deeply rooted, I think, human instinct, I think it's fair to say, um, to punish transgressors, right? To like reinforce certain, no certain norms. Um, but also, you know, some cultures, I think, are, have a stronger sense of you know, retributive justice perhaps than others, right? And I think it maybe seems natural to us that if someone does wrong, they should be punished, they should be shamed, you know, um, 
and that's you know part of the consequence. But I think there's sometimes we may lack awareness about ways we're doing that might actually just rather than causing remorse could actually just inflame anger yeah. and just create these same types of cycles of, of conflict. And I feel like yeah. that's that comes across really clearly from a lot of the yeah i mean i would even put a finer point on it jason i mean i think if you humiliate your enemy you're basically handing him a weapon Mm -hmm. which eventually will be used against you one way or the other right but it is something to be aware of that it doesn't work the way we instinctively feel like it will or want it to yeah right yeah um you know, so with all that said, right, like, I feel like, as you say, the emotion of, of humiliation uh, is really strong for Gary and um, helps to drive a lot of his story. And I, you know, can't help but feel like if Gary Freeman, this, you know, world renowned mediator can get sucked into high conflict, what hope is there for the rest of us? Um, but your book really offers a lot of constructive reasons to believe that we can actually extricate ourselves from high conflict. Um, and you know, pursue a different path. So I wonder what in reporting the book did you learn that actually gave you hope? I mean, do you think that there is actually another way that's possible? I definitely do. I mean, I went into it pretty skeptical, but, uh, you know, I was not, I was not someone who was super into like dialogue and peace and, you know, this kind of thing. And I came out the other side, totally bought into the idea that there is a way to do good conflict. I've not only seen it, I've been part of it. And it is actually almost a transcendent feeling like it is very cool to experience good conflict to be challenged and to challenge other people without sort of losing your dignity right and your sense of humanity and it's it's so it can be done i've seen it um and i really think it has to be done because we're so interdependent now right as a as a globe that we can't and even as a country we just can't function as we keep being reminded we can't thrive as a society until we fight better like we we sort of have to fight as if we have kids together, right? I mean, we can get divorced, fine, but we still have kids together, right? So we have to learn the skills to do that. And some of the things that Gary did was once he realized, so, so the first thing is he, he realized what had happened. Like he, he describes it as his personal derangement. He lost two years of his life, of his peace of mind to these petty political feuds that he would just ruminate over and lose sleep over and, um, And what happened was he hit a saturation point, which is something to look for when you or people you care about are in high conflict. In his case, there was a sort of midterm election. He wasn't on the ballot, but his allies were, and um, it got really ugly and his ally was ousted and that meant he had no power on this little board. And the whole thing was so upsetting that it forced him to kind of take stock, it created a pause, like a timeout in the conflict. And that's hugely valuable, right? All kinds of ways that can happen in conflict. It can be like a snowstorm or someone gets sick or someone gets killed, but there's a moment of opportunity. And this is where it's so important that the community, the people around you who aren't themselves totally stuck in the conflict have to help you see that you've reached the saturation point, which is what Gary's family did for him. They've told him repeatedly that they felt like, you know, they'd lost him. And eventually he realized what had happened. He distanced himself from the political organizer. He started relying much more on his wife for political advice, actually, because she really saw the neighbors as full three-dimensional, complicated people. She knew them very well and liked them. And so that was important. And he also started to, um, drop those binary categories, even in his own head about the old guard and the new guard. Right. So that was important. Yeah. Um, you know, there is, there are a lot of lessons actually, which I appreciate, uh, you point out in the book where, you know, if you are find yourself in a situation like Gary, the ways that you can actually identify and possibly help get yourself out of, or help other people get you out of those conflicts. And along those lines, you know, I never, in a book about conflict, I never thought that I would read so much about crockpots. (laughs) <laughs> um, but, yeah. but uh, you know, it is a is a recurring uh, motif in the book. So, so tell us about the significance of, of crockpots, you know, in the context of the book and of context of like recognizing getting out of high conflict. Yeah. So, as a storyteller, for me, one of the most fascinating things is to realize that most conflicts are not what they seem to be about. They're not. They're about that, but also about something else, which I call the understory, which is the thing underneath the conflict that nobody's talking about. 
Mm-hmm. And that's really interesting if you can get to it. So for an example, you know, I talk about a couple who was, you know, going to war over who was going to get the crock pot as they divvied up their possessions in a divorce. And by the way, every divorce attorney and mediator has a story like this. And, you know, what is the deal with the crock pot? I mean, they could have bought 20 crock pots, 200 crock pots with the amount they were paying their lawyers. So eventually, if you ask the right questions, you can get out of that talk track nightmare and find out that, you know, the wife, when she was a kid growing up, her parents would always have like a pot roast or something going every Sunday in the crock pot and you could smell it all through the house. And it was like something to her that felt like, like a good home and they'd gotten it off their wedding registry and they'd never used it. Like she and her husband didn't even like to cook. So that's why it was so weird that she was obsessing over this. Um, but for her, it meant something, something she hadn't yet achieved, but wanted to. And the husband, meanwhile, why did he want the crock pot? Well, he wanted it because she wanted it so badly. You see this a lot in divorces, right? That, you know, she, he didn't even want the divorce, but she did. So this is like one thing he could go to the mat on. Right. And, and a lot of this isn't even conscious. It's important to note, you know, uh, sometimes you get so wrapped up trying to win the fight you don't ask yourself and no one asks you these questions. So they didn't even realize necessarily why they were having this fight over the crock pot. There's been other couples who've done the same thing over Legos, over a broken hibachi grill. There's a sort of legendary story in California about a judge who got so sick of this couple arguing about a broken hibachi grill that he offered to bring in his own broken hibachi grill from his garage if they would just stop arguing. But of course, it wasn't really about the, it wasn't really about the grill. Yeah. Um, so I wonder, you know, in hearing all of those stories um, and taking some of those lessons, like what's been the biggest takeaway from your reporting for you personally? Like what's a skill that you've been using in your personal life as a result of writing the book? For sure, uh, this book has changed me in many ways, personally and professionally. The thing that has changed what I do every single day is... Uh, a a technique called looping for understanding, which is a form of active listening that actually Gary Friedman taught me through uh, his, an organization he co-founded in the Bay Area called the Center for Understanding and Conflict. And I went into this training thinking, you know, I know how to listen. I mean, I'm, you know, I professionally interview people (laughs) for many years and it turned out, you know, acting like you're listening and nodding like I am right now and smiling and going, "Mm, I hear you. That is not listening. And people can tell the difference. And uh, what I learned how to do is this thing called looping. And there's other forms of it that people may have uh, be familiar with. But in this case, it means you really listen to the person and you try to distill what they're saying into the most elegant language you can muster. So you don't literally need to repeat it verbatim, but you're really trying to get what is the crux of what's important to them, not to me, right? Which is very different for how most journalists go into conversations. (laughs) I think it's fair to say. And, uh, And then this is important. I used to forget this in the beginning. You have to check if you got it right. You have to say, so it sounds like you feel like this crock pot is like really important to your idea of what a happy home looks like. Is that right? Like really ask with curiosity. Curiosity is like the key to the kingdom, but it has to be genuine, right? And what you notice is that as soon as you do this, even if you get it wrong, you know, people will correct you and you keep getting deeper and deeper. People just like their whole expression and posture changes. Even if I'm, it's not that emotional of an interview, right? If I'm interviewing an academic or something, they're just so grateful to feel like you're really trying to get them. And it's, it's poignant because it reveals how rarely it actually happens, but there's a ton of cool research on this. And as soon as people feel heard, they open up, they say more nuanced, complicated things, uh, less exaggerated and uh, you know, sort of extreme things. And they're more likely to take in information they don't wanna hear. So it's, it's like this really key prerequisite to getting to good conflict. Yeah, I mean, in, in reading your descriptions, uh, of looping, like immediately it felt like something that I wanted to try to, you know, make more of it to, to try to do more often in my own life. And I wonder if you're game, um, because, you know, reading it and trying it on my own is one thing, but to actually hear it and, and see it demonstrated by someone who's really been practiced at it, I wonder if you'd be game to do it with me. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that'd be fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you, if you, uh, wouldn't mind like, you know, demonstrating looping and, and perhaps doing 
you know, the, the old way of listening. Uh, that you yeah. Are, okay. Cool. Yeah. So I'll, I'll ask you a question. The way I used to ask, let's. I'll pretend I'm interviewing you, right, for a story, and 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 just very quickly, I'll ask you a question, and I'll do it the way I probably used to do it, and then and then we'll stop, and do it again with looping, and, and everyone could see, like, and they tell the difference, and you can tell me if you feel a difference. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks. That's, that's okay. So since since we're talking about conflict, let's choose a conflict question. Um, so, what's one of the silliest things you've ever? argued about jason um speaking of crock pots <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah let's see how how embarrassing do i want to get well <laughs> I, I um here's here's a here's a really ridiculous story that comes to mind um which is um i uh this is a, a long time ago this and still remains the store point with a friend 15 years ago probably um I was driving with a friend and uh, we were trying to remember the name of a song and he um, he asked me the name of the song. I couldn't remember it. I, I swore to him that I was going to, you know, give me 10 seconds. I was going to remember the song. And uh, while waiting for me after 10 seconds for five seconds, he said, forget it. I'm just going to call our friend Dave. And he called this, called this friend to ask him to tell the name of the song. Um, and I got so upset to the point where I was driving and I started calling the same friend with you know my other hand, which I never do. Um, I was so incensed. It was such an, it felt like such an insult. Um, and I rarely get very mad or yell. I was yelling uh, so much at this friend and uh, he could not understand why I was so upset. I could not fully understand why I was so upset. It has like all the telltale signs actually of, of high conflict. Um, and when, what, I and didn't get it. You didn't, you didn't get to him first? I didn't, no, I didn't, didn't get to the friend first. Um, I don't think, I can't even remember. Um, but the, the conflict was really about like him doing this, but then also me trying to convince him that what he did was kind of mean and insensitive over this really, really stupid, silly thing. What was the name of the song? It was Desolation Row by Bob Dylan. I can remember the name now. I could not remember the name of the song then, yeah. Okay, and did it affect your friendship? Um, it did a little bit in the moment and for, you know, for maybe even days or weeks after, and still, we still talk about it to this day. Um, and yeah. where was it? It was um, nearby. I think we were driving. I think we had been uh, kayaking in Monterey Bay. Um, okay. So, yeah. Thank you, Jason. So that's, that's how I might've had that conversation go like a couple years ago. Uh, you know, I'm asking where, what, when, what happened, what's, what are the stakes? I'm asking what I'm interested in. Right. And actually, it's not that interesting, the things I'm interested in, because I'm not in your head, right? So um, let's try it one more time, and I'm going to try, try looping and see how that goes, okay? Um, so what's a silly argument that you've had, Jason? You can tell the same one, it's fine. Uh, well, um, I, I once got really upset with a friend who, uh, when I was trying to remember the name of a song, brought in, this, brought in another friend to give him the answer uh, preemptively. So it sounds like the fact that your friend couldn't be patient and just wait for you to figure it out and had to bring in, call, you know, call, call for help, really frustrated you and it maybe yeah. felt use the word insult it felt insulting to you is that right yeah it felt frustrating and actually um it felt like a rejection it felt like a, it felt like a it was a form of social in, in a weird way form of social rejection where mm. i um it was the, the friend that he called happened to be like the three of us were all close friends and it felt like in this dynamic, sometimes we have a group of three. It felt like, oh, you're choosing this other person over hmm. me. Like I'm, I'm trying to like, you know, do this thing with you, solve this problem, answer this question with you, but you're kind of rejecting me, uh, losing hmm. faith in me in the moment and actually turning to this other friend and bringing them in. So it was like you were in the car having this moment connecting with your friend and all of a sudden that was broken when he reached out to this third person and this old dynamic, it seemed like sort of flared up in a way that was hurtful. Is that, is that right? Yes, surprisingly hurtful, <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you for doing that <laughs> twice, which I know is hard. Uh, uh, 
did you notice a difference? Like, how did it feel? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, end of that? it was in, in the second case, you're, you're just, what you reflected back was like what my emotion was and what might have been actually driving what was kind of the understory of, of the conflict, right? The, the first one was much more about the circumstance and things that, you know, an outside observer might have, might have noticed or wanted to know some of those uh, sort of somewhat superficial details. And the second was much more about understanding my actual emotional reaction that might have been driving this really ridiculous conflict and making it into something that became much bigger than it needed to be. Hmm. And, and you use the word rejection on the second version of that yeah. conversation, which I thought was really powerful and honest, right? Um, and leaves you more, a little more open, right? To a little more vulnerable. Um, and I, I, I pointed that out because sometimes journalists will say to me, well, I don't have time to do this. You know, we have to get the story. We need clicks, whatever. And I'm like, you saw that didn't actually take more time. I don't think. And it's just a much more interesting story. <laughs> right? The second way, I think. So um, I think increasingly the older I get, you know, I interview a lot of people and a lot of times I do these long stories and I can't use half the people I talk to. I don't use, I don't quote them, which is kind of like crappy, you know? And I increasingly feel like the least I can do is listen to people. You know what I mean? Like really try to understand what they're saying. Even if I don't agree, even if I'll never be in their shoes, I can give them that one thing. And I, I actually think that's a, that's a pretty big deal. And it does lead to a better, better, better content. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder though, I mean, you, you talk about that in the book about just ways of honoring people's um, stories and really making them feel heard. Um, but I wonder in some cases, if you get pushback um, where hearing someone trying to understand someone could seem like legitimizing their point of view mm-hmm. when that point of view could be racist or hateful or you know or in some ways seem seem uh, violent. You know, how do you respond to that type of concern or critique? Yeah, I get that pushback a lot from journalists that I train on the, on these things, and also internally I feel it right. So I remember interviewing a woman who, um, you know, she just she just was like teeing off on George Soros and this and that and all these conspiracy theories. And it was irrelevant to the story I was trying to get, whatever that was. And it bothered me profoundly. And I could feel like every fiber of my being wanting to just hang up, you know, like I just wanted to end the call. Like I just wanted no part of it. Um, and I've learned to sort of at least notice that feeling, first of all, and get a little bit more curious about it. And uh, I ended up calling her back. I ended up, I did end the interview because again, yeah, I felt like I was complicit if I continued down this dark tunnel. Um, And I ended up playing the recording for Gary Friedman, who I've told you about, who does a lot of conflict work. And he gave me some ideas about what I could say and what, how I could have handled that and tried to go deeper with her. And what I've learned, and I did call her back and we did do that, and I did learn some more interesting things, but what I've learned is that people don't mistake it for agreement. We think that if we try to understand people and check to see if we, if we really are understanding what they're saying, that it sounds like we agree and people don't think that. They're not confused. <laughs> she knew I didn't agree with her, yeah. right? Um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is it's not a live broadcast, right? If it were live, that's a different thing because then I'm amplifying what she's saying, which is not good. But in this case, I control what makes it into the story and what doesn't. Yeah. So I think that's an important distinction. Um, and if we ever want to figure out like what is really going on with this George Soros obsession, right? We have to get deeper if not with her, with other people. And, and that's where you get to the good stuff. Even if you're never, ever going to change her mind, like that's not the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder, I mean, I can see that really shaping the way, I mean, you you were talking before about ways you incorporate into your personal life. I can really see it also informing the way that you do your work as a journalist Um, and it being really productive. I wonder still knowing everything that you know now, things that you've learned, where do you still get stuck? You know, either, either in your work or, or personally in, in conflict. Uh, 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I get stuck all the time. Like this is a life. I'm going to work on this, you know, till the day I die, you know, Mm -hmm. and there are levels of looping, first of all, that I have yet to, (laughs) I mean, there's a way to do looping where you're asking a follow-up question that actually pushes the person. So you're not just under trying to understand them. You're actually kind of maybe calling them out on something in a way that is also trying to understand them. Like there's a Jedi master level of looping that I've seen some very experienced mediators do that I have not yet achieved. And the more upset you are, the harder it is to do, right? So I do it with my kid all the time. It's great for parenting Mm -hmm. because it gets you out of that trap of thinking you have to fix everything or win the argument or like you, they just want to be heard. Like mostly what people want is to be heard. So you can give them that and move on. Right. Um, It's harder if I'm in an argument with my husband, right? Because that's just more of a core, you know, like most marriages have same fight over and over right we've gotten better about we'll literally talk about the crock pot so we can kind of skip some steps ideally and be like what are, what are we actually what are we actually arguing about you know? and then that's that's helpful because then you sort of don't spend all this time going back and forth about about the legos or the crock pot and you can yeah. hopefully get to it faster um yeah that's that is helpful um and i want to encourage people to, uh, I should have mentioned this earlier, but please, if you haven't already, to leave questions um, in the chat. Um, and I actually wanna, wanna turn, we've gotten a few questions so far um, from audience members. One last thing I wanted to ask you though, um, to in some ways circle back to the very, very start of the book is um, the epigraph for the book are, are these lines from, from Rumi, uh, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing. There is a field. I'll meet you there. Um, that's you know those are pretty famous lines, but I wonder what that quote meant for you in this context. Like, why did you choose it uh, at the outset of the book? I think because um, it is easy for me to fall into this binary trap where there's good versus evil, right versus wrong, you know, and uh, sometimes things are not complicated like there is a villain and he or she is wrong right but people are always complicated and that doesn't mean that people aren't right or wrong right but it does mean that the really good stuff the kind of change that we want to see in the world requires understanding you just can't get there all the way there with coercion or pressure Mm -hmm. and certainly not shame so how do we find that field where we have, we have an ability to try to understand each other with some level of grace or curiosity, even as we disagree. Like, I, I guess I used to think there's like three options. You can avoid the conflict, you can you know, fight to the death, uh, or you can change your mind, you can surrender, defect, whatever. But there's a fourth way. And that's what I think that that quote describes is, is trying to get to understanding even as we continue to disagree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, thanks. I wanted to, to shift to audience questions now. And thanks to Evan for um, sharing a lot of the ones that have come in so far. And, and please, um, please feel free to share your questions for Amanda in the chat. Um, one I wanted to share from uh, Elon Bratt uh, about, do you have any thoughts about how to have good conflict in a situation where the person you're in conflict with has more formal and informal power and authority than you do. Uh, and that part person is not engaged in creating conditions around them for productive disagreement and they're not responding when you loop. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there are people who at any given point in their life do not want to have good conflict. There are people who want to have high conflict. They're getting a lot out of it maybe a sense of power, maybe profit, maybe camaraderie, maybe meaning, often it's meaning, attention. And especially when there's a power difference, right? That's a, that's a problem you, can't, <laughs> you yeah. can't fix sometimes. And I think any conflict, you can change what you do. You can set boundaries, right? You can try to, um, you can try to distance yourself from high conflict people and conflict entrepreneurs. But you can't, you can't shift to good conflict with someone who doesn't want something different. 
And that's a hard, that's a painful thing. The good news is such as it is, what I found is that people change, like people, people can be really in it, really in high conflict or just totally bewitched by conspiracy theories or even extremists, you know, ideology, and then they change. And so the part of the challenge is how long can I stay in this person's life if I care about them, right? Um, in the hopes that one day they, there will be an opening, there will be a saturation point. Right. Yeah. I mean, and you also talk a lot about ways that we, uh, when possible, like, and that we need to collectively design our institutions so that they actually nurture, you know, good conflict and don't actually perpetuate high conflict, which seems like, you know, a bigger task than maybe anyone yeah. individually in a, in a toxic relationship, but also feels like, you know, uh, something else to, to, for us all to aspire to and be useful, actually, I mean, for you to share a little bit about what you see as the hallmarks of a good institution that actually fosters the right kind of conflict and doesn't just actually perpetuate high conflict. Yeah. So the, I wrote about this synagogue in New York City that almost imploded in conflict over Israel. And they ended up uh, slowly, painfully deciding that they were going to just totally change how they dealt with conflict. And it took them a year and they brought in, you know, people who had worked in the Middle East on mediation and they would have these like these workshops, these hard conversations and like they worked on listening and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And they got really curious about each other's differences and they did shift the norms and the understanding, like the level of, you know, sophistication around conflict so that the next time they had a big internal, you know, dispute, which in this case was over interfaith marriage, they knew what to do. They had those rituals and you know, habits of mind. And they found that that conflict, rather than making them you know, weaker as an institution, made them stronger. Even though like, it's not like everybody changed their mind, right? Like there's still deep disagreement about interfaith marriage at the synagogue, but it's, it was very cool to see how that shifted and how, people, how surprised people were that, that they could actually there was so much that they hadn't understood about each other, even as they disagreed. And just very quickly, before I forget to the question about what do you do with someone who has more power and doesn't want to listen and doesn't want to loop and doesn't want good conflict, I would recommend there's a place called the High Conflict Institute, uh, a therapist and lawyer named Bill Eddy co-founded it. And he has written a bunch of books about how to deal with high conflict personalities in the workplace and in other places. Um, including when there's a power differential, they're very like, you know, user-friendly tips for what to do and what to do on social media. So I would recommend that. Great. Thanks. Um, and you said it's the High, high, high conflict, conflict Institute. Institute. Yeah. Got Bill Eddy, E-D-D-Y. He's got a bunch of books out. Right. Um, so uh, another question sort of related to some of these power dynamics, if from, uh, this is from Arnie Patel, if someone tries to humiliate you, what's a good way to respond? Hmm. So I think um, the the very the very like Zen way to respond, which I'm not saying I would pull off, but I want to put it out there as a you know aspiration, is to realize in the moment somehow that you know humiliation is subjective, like we were saying, right? Like those women who had to keep making and remaking their beds didn't feel humiliated. So some of it is, okay, what is the story I'm gonna tell myself in that nanosecond about what just happened here? And is there a story I can tell myself that doesn't make it okay, right? But also doesn't make it humiliating because generally speaking, humiliation is the kind of emotion that um, escalates and sort of, uh, poisons the conflict for everyone, mm -hmm. not just for the, not just for your opponent. So it's like, how can I tell myself a different story about what happened there? And some, sometimes the way to do that is to realize what drives that kind of behavior, the behavior of shaming, shunning, humiliating. And just very quickly, Curtis Toller, the former gang leader that I followed in Chicago, he talks very movingly about uh, how he himself acted as a conflict entrepreneur when he was in uh, the Black Peace Donation gang. And he had this rivalry with the gangster disciples. And he just felt like, you know, he wanted to be in the conflict mm. and he did want to humiliate and he did want to exert power. And he talks about the layers of 
motivations, right? And one motivation was the group identity. It was a long-standing war between these two gangs, and it felt like this was a way to find justice, right? But then there was another motivation, which was profit, right? In the drug market, he didn't want them on his, on his part of the neighborhood, right? And he would use the war and the ideological differences as justification for the profit incentive. But the deeper you go with him, it's so interesting. He talks about how he had internal conflict he had internal conflict through the trauma that he had experienced being physically abused as a kid in Chicago and seeing a lot of violence done to his mother. So what he tells the young men he works with now through Chicago cred trying to prevent gang violence in Chicago is, you know, you're not going to be able to stop these external conflicts until you work on the internal conflict. And that can be hard to do and not everybody's ready or able or willing to do it uh, at any given time. But yeah. usually when people are, you know, that old cliche hurt people hurt is true, right? So trying to kind of figure out what is actually going on with this person can help you create a little distance sometimes. Yeah, uh, no, appreciate that. Um, well, there's another question actually about even a, I'm going from the interpersonal to even for a more macro level conflict. This question's from Joanne. Uh, she wants to thank you. This, this feels really timely for her and that she just left Myanmar after, after living there for 10 years. Um, and she, she writes, Donna Hicks writes about dignity, which relates to what, she, what you're saying about humiliation. Some intractable conflicts have a humiliation or a dignity violation that spans decades. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts about time spans and the durability of conflict that spans such a long time. And what are points of opportunity uh, in those cases, which is, you know, might relate to some of your reporting on, on Colombian civil war actually in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then that's something that comes up with with gang violence as well, is it can be generational, just like clan feuds in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can go back a very long time. I talk about the Hatfield and the McCoy story um, as part of that in the book. So yeah, oftentimes, like when when Curtis is investigating a gang conflict, the first thing he wants to know is how, what is the root cause? Like, where did this start? And what's interesting is people often will not know. Like he'll have to do a lot of sleuthing to find out, oh, it goes back 20 years to when this one guy's watch was stolen off a basketball court. Now, is that the, no, that's the crock pot, right? Like that's not what it's really, it's really about disrespect, humiliation, justice, belonging, but uh, that's the narrative. That's how it sparked, right? That's how it started. And so figuring out what that is. And one of the things that he still marvels about is how there's still this, you know, this really violent, feud going on between two organizations in Chicago. It's been going on for 20 years, but the people who started those organizations are locked up in cells right next to each other at a supermax prison and they're friends, mm -hmm. right? They have no beef with each other. So um, sometimes these historical conflicts take on a life of their own that detaches from the facts or the people involved. And part of what he tries to do is to educate the people that are shooting at each other now about like these founders who are friends, you know, just to create a little cognitive dissonance about that story that's being told. But yeah, historical conflict is a very hard one. It becomes, it creates collective emotion, right? So anytime you have collective emotion, it really metastasizes high conflict because you don't have to personally be attacked, but if someone in your history or someone loosely affiliated with you, you've never met gets attacked, it feels the same way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, but you actually in the book, it's, it's interesting, you talk about um, the sort of contagion that can work the other way as well. I think the Peter Coleman research that you report on and finding that complexity can be contagious. Yeah, you're right. Like there are ways that actually, um, you know, some of these uh, difficult emotions and conflicts can actually perpetuate conflict well beyond the original conflict, but also there are ways where uh, learning you know, secondhand about um, other people's stories and complexity can actually help mitigate conflict too. Under actually, if you could share a little bit, and that, that research uh, out of Columbia is really interesting and I think encouraging as yeah. well. You share a little bit about some of those findings. Right, so Peter Coleman and his colleagues run something called the Difficult Conversations Lab at Columbia, where they pair up people who disagree strongly on really controversial subjects, whether it's you know abortion or gun control or whatever. And then they have like a 20 minute conversation that's recorded um, in which they try to come up with a, a statement they could both publicly put their names to. 
And you can imagine that sometimes this goes badly, right? And they have to actually end the conversation before the 20 minutes are up. Um, but other times it goes, it goes well in the sense that uh, people do experience anger and frustration, but they also experience flashes of curiosity, of humor, mm -hmm. of understanding. They ask more questions. So you can literally see in the data analyses of these recordings, you can see good conflict and you can see high conflict. You can see in high conflict, it's the same two emotions over and over and over, anger, frustration, anger, frustration. Uh, and, and then in good conflict, it's like a galaxy of emotions. So um, you can literally visualize it. And what they found is they could actually induce good conflict conversations by having people before they went in read a short news story that was about some other big controversy, but acknowledge complexity explicitly. It said, you know, there are more than two sides to this debate. Um, it's, you know, if you ask the polling question a different way, you get a different answer. Sometimes people have internal, you know, ambivalence about this subject and just acknowledge the real, the, the truth, which is you can't divide millions of people into two buckets. Like it just, humans don't work that way. So there are usually more sides and more complexity and acknowledging that seemed to, as you said, be contagious. And then that complexity was carried into the conversation, which was very cool. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, encouraging, you know, as we think about uh, kind of the, some of the, the ruts that we seem to be in uh, as a country right now. And actually, um, there's a question from Michelle to that about how can we as a nation bridge the divide that we have right now? Things seem to get more violent every day. I assume this is a question you might get a lot these days. You know, how are you thinking about now the national polarization and intense partisanship we're dealing with? Yeah, I mean, we have a found foundational problem, which is we don't have a news source that is trusted by both sides of this political conflict. And that's not true in many other conflict zones around the world. Mm -hmm. So we are gonna keep having alternate realities because the sources of information are very different at this point, which has to do with deep distrust, right? Deep distrust in government, in the news media, in each other. Those things have to be dealt with. In my opinion, fear is the understory of America's political conflict, racial conflict. Fear is something that we don't talk enough about. I wish that every news organization had a fear beat instead of a politics beat. You know, that is, that is what we need to start talking about. We need to get much more sophisticated in how we fight and also how we talk about the fighting, right? So part of what I do is is just look for those saturation points, you know, and how can we in our own corner of the world seize those opportunities? How can we amplify the voices of Americans who are not extremists? Because right now they've gone silent. This happens in every high conflict all over the world is, you know, people who are sort of more open and malleable and, and want to be curious about each other, they flee the scene and the extremists take over. They take over social media, they take over news accounts. So. Part of my job, I think, is to help raise up the voices of people who have changed or people who are curious or people who are confused or distressed about the country, which, by the way, is 80 percent of the country. 80 percent of the country is very worried and, and exhausted by the level of political conflict. So I have a lot of faith that, you know, may be naive, but I have a lot of faith that there's a huge unmet demand among the exhausted majority of Americans who want something different out of our political conflict and who are just, just, just ready for something, something different. And, uh, and that demand has yet to be met, but I think it could be. Yeah, well, I think your book goes a long way toward meeting that and I think helping to, to stoke that demand as well. And I think just the turnout that we've seen uh, tonight for this event and for, for your talk and for this this book is is telling and I think the level of engagement um, we've seen in the chat as well is also just speaking to to that really deep hunger for for a different way. Um, I'm sorry we can't actually get to to all of the questions, but really appreciate uh, all of the questions and and all the engagement from everyone who has turned out this evening. And just want to thank you, Amanda, again for your time, for the book, for elaborating on, on so many of the ideas uh, in it with us tonight. Um, and thank you again for contributing a really vital and really timely resource at a time when I think a lot of us need it, you know, personally, you know, in our communities and nationally. Yeah, well, thank you for having me and thank you to everyone for being here tonight. And if there are things that you want to
you know, have a conversation about, feel free to email me, amanda at amandaripley.com. And uh, I hope we can keep the conversation going.